Uh, you feeling all right there, buddy? You got a little cumber on your face. No, I'm just kidding. They're just those jellyfish things. Hey, everybody, it's Chugga Conroy. Welcome back to more Splatoon 2. Last time, we had an explosive time with the map rotations. But it's okay, because we gained a greater appreciation for the world and had a pretty fun time down here in Deep Sea Metro. Now, we're going to continue our trip around the beeline. Seeing if we can fill in all this before we go after the thing. So it's going to be a little bit before we actually go after that, because we are going to be playing every level eventually. B6. Blowing up like it's all good. Notorious Station. We are playing with no main or special weapon. We are playing this with a curling bomb, and that is the only option. As someone who just loves zipping all around with these things, I'm pretty for it. No ink saver sub, unfortunately. Go past, let them go boom. You can actually kill enemies pretty effectively with them. They do have high object damage too, so remember that. These are not them though, but they, they just remind me of the Oct Torpedo that I complimented a while back. So, I want to tell you that apparently I don't know what a haiku is. I was saying that the poems that you saw on the mem cakes were haikus. No, they are eight syllables each line. They are a play on haikus, but also a play on the fact that the number eight is literally everywhere in this mode. So, yeah, I didn't really know the syllable count that made something a haiku. I thought haikus just... Okay, I'm gonna be frank. The only thing I really knew about haikus was just the fact that they sounded weird. <laughs> that was all I knew. I didn't know what actually made them. I would listen to them and they... or I would, like, hear them and they were always just nonsense where it was like, uh, man want coconut, coconut very high, ladder is mightier than tree, or something like that. I, I just, I thought they were weird, okay? Uh, okay, recharged ink, get that. And kaboom! That's precisely what I would have done myself! Speaking of being wrong on the internet and hearing all about it, uh, I got it wrong that Pearl and Marina are agents of the Squid Beak Splatoon when I said they were agents five and six. I think I was just mentally filling in blanks because those numbers were not taken, they were working with us and all that stuff, but no. They found Cap and Cuttlefish by chance. They are merely working with the Squid Beak Splatoon and not official members. So that is not how that is. Some of you told me that you were surprised to learn this when the comments were correcting me, so I know I'm not the only person who just filled in those two empty spaces. Nice and easy. We're starting off pretty simple today. We now have B7. We're playing bingo. You may rely on it. Fly eight ball station. Destroy all the bumpers before time runs out. We play with no weapon at all. Please destroy all the ball bumpers before time runs out. Use the right switch to move it, uh, move it right, and the left switch to move it left. Take care out there. Once again, he has no faith in us whatsoever. I do not blame him. One life? Okay. Uh, we gotta. Oh, oh, okay. I get it. We're playing breakout, baby. Look at this. Oh, come back. Come back. No, no, no. Do that. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, this is fine. Okay, so it's just kind of a war of attrition. Just a fun little place. Almost done. Uh. Oh, get that. Break those. All right, last one. Such a fun idea. I I like the single player already, but man does Octo Expansion just take it to a whole new level where you get fun little mini games like this that use the mechanics in just new and weird ways. Love this kind of stuff. Uh, go do that, and no. I'm, I'm praising you, game. You're supposed to give me the wind juice when I praise you. Uh, there it is, test passed. Hmm, kind of wondering if we should do a third one just because, uh, huh, maybe not. Maybe I don't want to get overly ambitious with this. Let's just call it a day, go look at our mem cakes, and then carry on. Octobomber. Destroy your troubles, bombs away. Attempting thought, bring all to naught. No wonder your friends tend to stray. 
You face away, thinking me blind, like I don't know you won't show. Your love is still clear from behind. That rhyme in the middle reminds me of that episode of Ed, Ed, Nettie where he goes, No joke when it's broke, don't be blue. Let Ed's quick repair service fix it and you won't sue. <laughs> I love that line. Okay, well, I guess we're going to head back to Ingopolis Square and see something new. Our topic of the day is Splatfests. These were events that took place over the first four years or so of Splatoon 2. Even though they promised us two years of Splatfest and there was a final fest to end them all, they went back on that and held four more even after the so-called final one. Basically, you'd pledge yourself to a team that would answer a question, such as, do you think pineapple on pizza is gross or disgusting? <laughs> <laughs> wow, I might be a little bit biased there when naming those teams, but no. There was, do you prefer your juice with pulp or no pulp? Do you prefer eating with a fork or a spoon? And the unfortunate question of which playable race is better than the other. If you can believe it, occasionally they'd get even more heated. And you'd be deciding who the best Ninja Turtle was in a tournament style. The answer was Donatello, by the way. Mikey got robbed in the first round. I sadly can't blow your mind with there being a crossover with SpongeBob SquarePants, which was probably the greatest crossover Splatoon's ever done. The only other crossover to speak of was one with Mario's 35th anniversary, where the Splatfest was, would you prefer a Super Mushroom or a Super Star? Hidden within the confines of the game's code is this graphic of Team Egg versus Team Omelette, which has never happened in any region of the world ever. Maybe it's for the best, though. Team Egg couldn't even beat a bunch of chickens in the Splatfest that actually happened. After picking a team, the event carried on for one, two, or three days. It kind of varied, to be honest. And for that time, you would play Turf Wars. Yep, good old non-skill dependent Turf Wars. During Splatfest, you were free to pick your shoes and hat, but your shirt was always locked in to be a shirt representing the team you had, and the main ability was always Ability Doubler. This shirt always took a constant 7,500 points for each ability slot, meaning it could be scrubbed over and over again for easy ability chunks by talking to Merge. In fact, back in 1.0, it was consistent with all other three-star gear, with level one only taking 2,000 points. So every few games, you could just scrub one ability chunk off of it and get tons of them. Every Splatfest had a new stage introduced that was built specifically around the mechanics of Turf Wars. We've been over them before, they were the Shifty Stations. Every single Shifty Station has a literary reference in the title because they were named and designed all by Marina, and Marina likes books, so she thought she could just sneak in literary references behind Pearl's back. Splatfest had many exclusive decorations in areas throughout Ingopolis. There was Splatoween and Frostyfest. In fact, we've never seen any snowy region in Splatoon at all, but we know it exists based on various lore. There's obviously the Frostyfest decorations having to be based on something, and the fact that Bisque is from a frigid region. Splatfest took place at night, enabling you to see what the maps look like after closing hours. Inkopolis Square was a great big party full of its own secrets. Let me tell you the legend of the squid on the moon. See it? Right there. It's pretty funny that this is the thing, how they adapted the whole man on the moon urban legend and actually put it there to see if anyone would notice. Well, I did. Jellyfish now changed their colors to support their favorite Splatfest team when they didn't do this in Splatoon 1. Playing off of the whole hive mind thing that we learned earlier, one jellyfish realized it could change its color one day by mistake, and the rest all realized that they've been capable of bioluminescence the whole time. When playing on a Splatfest team, the game would try its darndest to give you a team name. I mean it, it would majorly force names out of this. Looking for just anything that unites your four random squids at all. Such as the classic straw boating turquoise kicked undercover Sorella Brella crew. Ding, thumbs up. In this screenshot, you can see that there were 10 times battles and 100 times battles. Your win in one of these battles would be worth 10 or indeed 100 wins, making it so that you could cause shakeups to happen in the overall rankings. Manage to win one of these battles and your name would go on a marquee for all online players to see when it happened. So what was your motivation for playing in Splatfest? After the votes were tallied, you would obtain Super Sea Snails, and the number was based on your rank and if you were on the winning side. 
These can now be gotten with every single level up after level 30, so it's not the only way to get them anymore, but it was a way to get lots of them quite easily, and it's the reason why my equipment spreads are so good without being over level 100. Now we're gonna go over the Final Fest! First of all, I have this official swag from the Final Fest from a convention while it was going on. Thank you, thank you. Uh, but besides that, it was Chaos versus Control! No, not really. It was uh, Chaos versus Order, but I just really wanted to do that. On the official Splatoon Tumblr, we learned that Mr. Grizz was neutral in this Splatfest, which is saying a lot because it was deciding the fate of the world. Would you rather live in a world ruled by chaos or ruled by order? Mr. Grizz not caring about the fate of the world despite claiming to save it is also kind of sketch. Also, Callie was on Team Chaos and Marie was Team Order. Finally, Callie can actually win at something! Funny what happens when she's not leading a team saying that she's the better squid sister. If you thought I was joking when I said Splatfest decide the fate of the world, you have no idea. One of the coolest things about Splatoon, and this is something that I tell my friends about when they're curious about the game, is that the outcomes of these Splatfests actually impact the direction of the story. Marie was the winner of the final fest back in Splatoon 1 against Callie, and Marie is the Squidbeak Splatoon's interim leader while Cap'n Cuttlefish is away trying to solve Callie's disappearance, with Callie's loneliness being a big catalyst for the story of this game. On top of that, Team Chaos was the winner of this final fest. The stuff that we've seen in Splatoon 3 looks pretty chaotic and like it's pretty in line with what we saw in the imagery of Team Chaos. Personally, I was a little disappointed that Team Chaos won. I actually very much wanted Team Order. Let me explain. I thought it would be really cool if you had a Splatoon game that had a wildly different style where it was the whole everything is chrome in the future and everything's all shiny and perfect and you're like the last force in the world trying to make the world all messy and weird again. I, I like that. I think that would have fit Splatoon well and had a really strong identity so I was kind of sad it didn't win. Another way Splatfests were historically significant was a poll that was held leading up to the final fest of Splatoon 1, where they were deciding which stages were the most popular. In Japan, Walleye Warehouse was the number one most popular stage. In North America and Europe, Moray Towers. In Australia and other regions, Kelp Dome. Every single one of these maps were among the first added to Splatoon 2, which I don't think is a coincidence. Yep. If you were ever mad about Moray Towers coming back for another game, that's right, it's our fault! Why is America dumb? If I could toss in my own opinion about Splatfest, one thing I find funny is that whenever Splatfests are over, a lot of the people from the sidelines who don't seriously play Splatoon always go, uh, dead game. But speaking as someone who knows a lot of competitive players and considers himself a pretty avid ranked player, Splatfests are my least favorite part of the game. Having the casual community and competitive community mashed together for a day and having to only play Turf Wars when I'm not wild about that mode in the first place, I honestly kind of like it better when there aren't random days where I'm forced to play Turf Wars to get rewards. Plus, the difference in skill when you mash those two communities together is massive, and it makes it just less fun to play than Turf Wars already is. If I can be frank, I know kids are the future of the community and I have nothing against kids playing Splatoon. It is absolutely their game as much as it is anyone else's. It's wonderful that kids want to participate, but if one team name is way cooler than the other, all the younger players are going to end up on that team and it causes the division in skill to be even larger, making the game less fun for everyone. I also dislike how short Splatfests were. They shortened the duration on average from what it was in the first game, where most Splatfests were only 24 hours. And to play like 30 matches, that's pretty demanding of your time. And I remember getting headaches, but feeling like I had to press on because I wanted to get the items. I also have to say one of the few features that was removed from Splatoon 2 was the ability to revisit the event exclusive Inkopolis plazas. You could do this with Amiibo in Splatoon 1, yet it's absent from Splatoon 2. There is no way to revisit those event-exclusive locations. So there you go. A history and treatise on the various events that we can no longer play in. As I impale my eyeballs. 
Uh, let's just, uh, leave Joe here to do whatever he's into and move on to the weapon of the day. Ow. Oh, were you wondering why the final fest wasn't Pearl versus Marina this time if it was Callie versus Marie before? The canon reason is Pearl saying, Marina, the fans like you more than they like me. I've seen the internet. The Assassin's Favorite Hair Dryer, the Luna Blaster! The shortest range of all weapons, but the blast comes out quick. After the first one is fired, it slows down and takes two thirds of a second to shoot again. Now, you might look at the trail of ink and say, what are you talking about? The ink brush is way shorter range. But I'm talking about effective range in the epicenter of the blast. The blast area is almost the largest of any blaster, and it's only fast at killing if it lands dead center the first time, which is the only reason it has that deceptive range. If it requires any additional shots to land a hit, it's one of the slowest DPS, with the splash damage doing 25 to 35, and the inner blast area hitting for 50 to 70. If it lands two hits, it will likely get the win without much need to aim. The large blast will coat the enemy's feet with ease just so long as it lands, too. This is a lightweight weapon, enabling it to get all over the map, and the shots have perfect accuracy while on the ground. One limitation of the movement is only having a 50% chance to shoot inward while in the air, so plant the feet into attack with consistency. If it misses, it's probably dead. Precise and creative movement is everything for a blaster. It's got a slower fire rate, shorter range, and worse painting capabilities than most weapons, so misleading your opponents is what it's all about. As a nice bonus, the shot only consumes 7.5% ink. Blasters are usually much hungrier, so you get 13 blasts with this one. Downside is a long ink recovery lag that goes for a full second. It has to lay low at least some of the time in order to work. Speaking of that, you want to lay low at least some of the time for it to work. It's the shortest range of anything and can't tangle with two at once. Attack from where they can't see you, break them, and then get out before anyone else knows where it came from. Only shoot the unknown when using the large blast area to check a corner. Telegraphing yourself and announcing your presence is about the worst thing you can do because any foe is capable of just spacing you out and won't have to get in close to finish you. Don't challenge Ink Armor, it's pure evil. You're so slow at landing multiple hits and well within everyone's effective range to do so that the armor is going to win. If it sounds like I'm telling you how to shoot your gun like it's an absolute, I kinda am in this case. Being the shortest of all weapons and having harsh penalties from missing means that it's severely limited in terms of when it can attack anything at all. So when should it attack? It's great at attacking areas where squids think they're safe, many weapons struggle to attack around corners, and its blasts have so much horizontal reach they can hit around pretty much anything. Beyond that, attacking up on ledges up close is often a weakness for other types, and it's not so for the Luna. It's all about catching them off guard, mixing up movement, and flanking them. Its sub-weapon is Splat Bomb! Normally, this is one of my favorite sub-weapons. But because the main weapon outrange is nothing, there's not really a way to trap a shorter range foe and make them fight you at a disadvantage. It painting from far away isn't going to trap in most situations either. Generally, this is most useful to get them to drop their ink armor, since that's usually such a problem. Use the sub-weapon to do damage when shooting multiple times isn't wise due to an object in the way. I'd recommend tossing it at their feet when you think you're about to die and to suppress range threats for a few seconds. This helps teammates score a win more often than it does for you. Since the Luna is going to be hanging low and keeping the element a surprise, might as well toss this in their way when they otherwise can't get in close and shoot. Besides that, it's a top off whenever you just need a few more special points for your baller. It's funny how things keep happening between weapons beside another. This is one of the few lightweight ballers. 170 points isn't terribly high of a charge, but its ink coverage is so tiny that it will struggle to earn it without abilities or landing wins. If it fails to rush in and wipe the enemy team members at present, it's a sitting duck, and the splash damage is so low that it might not even land a kill if it misses the direct hit after the baller explodes. Of course, free reload could allow for a splat bomb, but that's really about it. When it's actually deployed, I feel this is better for getting out of trouble. 
The movement is great, and the baller gives it a shield and lets it get back into position if there's someone else present after your successful first attack. The baller is also about the only way it can be unshackled from a normally restrictive set of movement options. Think about it. You have a blaster and a splat bomb, but nothing but the blaster is going to be able to move you past enemy ink in a reasonable amount of time. Main power-ups effect on Luna Blaster is reduced damage falloff from an indirect shot, causing the minimum splash damage area to be larger and ink that spreads out on the ground while airborne. Confused? So was I. In layman's terms, it makes things more lenient. <laughs> special mention to special power-up. Just a few subs increasing the splash damage area can make a difference when it's so easy to follow up with a bomb or a shot. Luna Blaster Neo, equipped with Ink Mine. I guess it prevents it from being snuck up on. I don't know, it feels kind of naked without a real bomb or anything ranged when dealing with the shortest range there is. It's just kind of cruddy. It might track an enemy and make them easier to blast, but that's so unreliable. Just pop these whenever the enemies have to pass through as a form of suppression, or place them behind where you will be. Suction Bomb Launcher, there it is! An uncommon special with a low charge of 170 points. This allows the Neo to take map control of a large area, particularly helpful in splat zones. In fact, I'd say that's where the set shines most due to the mine painting in the zone if you've placed it, and it being obvious where enemies have to shoot to advance the game state. Hang out in the zone, use the mines and special there to just be a real troll. No object will stand in your way. The main weapon's slow fire rate is a non-issue when it has the special. And the Kenza Luna Blaster with Fizzy Bomb! Finally another one of these! Tossing it without a cook is a better movement option than waiting on a blast, instantly making the most mobile of the three. You're less helpless when needing a small touch-up to move a certain way, too. The Fizzy Bomb is just real deadly when charged, allowing this weapon to attack from far away. You can always swim into range with the trail the bomb leaves behind, and then follow up for a quick finish that barely needs to be aimed at all. Alternatively, it's a good distraction for those many situations where Luna just can't get in safely. It gives it something to contribute where the Neo wouldn't be able to. Fizzy's a good paintbrush for your special, which is Ink Storm! 170 is one of the lowest Ink Storm charges there is, all while the Fizzy Bomb is a good painting sub-weapon. Damage over time racks up surprisingly quick and can bridge the gap for a blaster to score a splat. Or it's just a way to gain control of a situation far away when Luna struggle with such a task normally. That's sort of this weapon. It helps out the group when it can't exactly fight directly good with how severely limited the main weapon can be. Speaking of which, if it has no goal to go towards otherwise, just throw it where you want an easy way in. The storm does a good job protecting the user. Use a fizzy bomb after a free reload for a quite deadly combo that's effective from far away. Its whole style changes after the special comes in, where it goes from playing stealth to making everyone move around predictably while it has an amazing and uncommon throwing attack not found on other blasters. How funny we went over the nighttime events while we were playing the Luna Blaster, huh? Where are we going? The ranked battle stages are Rainmaker Camp Triggerfish and Rainmaker Piranha Pit. Yo, Rena, you should totally sample some of the sounds here. Hmm, what if I recorded the sound of grinding gravel and then distorted it? Marina, you're a genius on the same level as Yoshi's voice being a record scratch played backwards. Here's what I decided to go with. I am, uh, staying at home in my pajamas while also trying to not get my mother sick. So I was torn on this one. Every single set had legitimate advantages for the current map and mode rotation. I could have very well have chosen the suction bomb launcher just for the object damage alone. Nothing can beat that, and... You know, it might be kind of hard to charge up the special at all times, but hey. I went with some Ink Saver sub in my build just so that we can get, um, we can get things moving really well. Um, we get up at the start of the match so I could use my Fizzy Bomb over and over again juggling it. I do have enough Ink Saver sub to allow for double Fizzy Bombs, which is one of the things people like the most about the sub weapon. That E-Leader is going to be rough and it's going to be quite ironic with some of the things I am about to say about that weapon. Okay, so, uh, getting some assists with the bomb, that's pretty good. As long as you're hitting it all with it, it's always good. This is a weapon that I'm very hit or miss with. I'm very all or nothing, where 
either I'm incredibly good with it, I'm getting picks, I'm getting kills, I'm just doing it all, or I'm completely worthless, like right now. I knew that was going to happen the second I slipped off of that cliff and I didn't mean to do it! Oh. Uh, gonna go this way, gonna play risky business. That is right near the Rainmaker! Oh, no! Always the E-Leader! Kudos to you for playing it. I, it's not an easy weapon at all to get used to. Okay, they lost the Rainmaker. I'm gonna go over here. I gotta sneak around. Gotta advance down their flank, or whatever it is Dunban says. Their weak right flank. Uh, this is actually their weak left flank, so crap. I'm not experienced in that. I can only do things that were said in Xenoblade verbatim. Okay. Uh, what? Bow. Nope. Okay, at least I stopped the objective. At least I stopped it. So, kind of going into how I was saying that I like every single one of these weapons for the current map and rotation, I want to encourage you. Being a flex player does not mean, oh, I play the splatter shot and I sometimes play the splat dualies. No. I think being a flex player means that you play multiple weapon classes. Like, maybe you're good with blasters, maybe you're good with rollers as kind of a niche option, and then you kind of have, like, more mainstream weapons where you like splatlings or various other things. I think you should try multiple weapon classes. I think you should consider different kits on weapons you already like. Play I've already said that playing everything is one of the ways that I think I've been able to improve as a player, because if you hate fighting something, play it. That is how you learn the capabilities of that weapon. You learn what it doesn't like to see. By just having one weapon for everything, I don't think that you're as likely to have consistent results when there's so many different maps and modes. I've mentioned there's over a hundred different maps to learn in this game, and that's a lot. It really is. And different modes have very different needs. Have a few weapon classes that you like. That's going to make you a better player. It's going to make you have better game sense. It's going to have you knowing what the capabilities of your enemy is at any given time. It's just a really good thing to get into. I like, I like recommending that to people more than anything. Go over here. Uh, oh, here we go. Here we go. Ah, ha, ha, ah, ha, 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 ha. I used that for an approach. That was good. Oh, we got something. Ah, point blank. Uh, let's uh, make your life hard so you can't retreat. And I just sniped you anyway. Oh, oh, nice, nice, nice. If you can get slipping behind people, it's just such a fun weapon to do that with. I might pick up the Rainmaker here just because I just used my special, so whatever. I'm already tracked. I don't care. <laughs> if I can get an escort, that would be nice. Okay, the sloshing machine is trying. Alright, it's just a slosher. Freaking great to making this thing hard to use. Kind of just a minute left. Uh. I don't want to keep backing up because it's just going to make it easy for them to approach right. He, he just ran past me. You just ran past me, bro! Uh, do I dare just rush this? Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> this is really silly! I'm just going to hide back here. We got 20 seconds left before this thing detonates. Uh, the sniper is down. That guy is not down. <laughs> well, that was certainly a push. <laughs> That's one thing I can say about it. And they already popped the Rainmaker again. I'm uh, going to toss that. Nope. <laughs> Sniped again. Yeah, the E-Leader is going, grabbing the Rainmaker and immediately lost it. Was just trying to stop it from despawning, I guess. They just popped it. Oh. Nope. Wasn't gonna win that. If you're ever noticed, you're pretty much done. A lot of sub power up stacking on a 10 attack. Interesting choice. I guess maybe that's for the map, because um, on the current map you can throw stuff over the gorge. It can always be helpful. Sure, I'll go with you. I'm not exactly backline support, but I'm a meat shield. Uh, this is really working. <laughs> that was amazing! What a way. Wild and wacky, weird way to win that was! Now, now, game. I thought we said we weren't gonna do this as long as I wasn't mean to you about it. Yeah. Please don't let this take over an hour again. <laughs>
I saved our life right there. That was all me. You losers were nowhere even close. Triple, 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 and he's still getting the Rainmaker. What is this? Good example of what getting lucky with this weapon looks like. I beat a heavy splatling in a direct fight and lost to an arrow spray. Didn't do so hot the second time around. They ended up bagging us where they just held the Rainmaker in their base for the rest of the time limit. We understand each other. You only trolled me once today. Okay. Hey, hey, on the yo cray. You don't know Pig Latin. I hope I didn't just say something racist. Uh, let's go. I'm gonna use my uh, fizzy bombs to my advantage once again. So I want to tell you a little trivia about the fizzy bombs. It's theorized that the soda in this world is made from kelp. The uh, clearly kelp dome is farming something for some reason. Uh, and there's the fact that the logos that are seen in Kelpdom are seen on the can of the Fizzy Bomb. So it's just kind of an accepted theory that that might be what's going on here. Gotcha. And I'm probably not- no, I'm not gonna win that. So I thought that was kind of cool. Sort of reminds me of a pretty decent episode of Spongebob called Best Frenemies, where Krabs and Plankton team up to take on the Kelp Shakes. It just always what it reminds me of. I guess Kelp is kind of used in a lot of things, so it makes sense. Oh boy, uh, did not think I was gonna get shot there. Speaking of the physical design of things, the Kenza Luna Blaster is one of the few times where I think the Kenza version is the best looking version of something. Normally I'm always on about how boring the Kenza version of a weapon looks, and how they really should have just done the Sheldon's picks again, and not just excluded cool looking weapons from the game for the sake of these boring ass ones. Uh, there we go! Didn't actually land any damage there. Uh, let's suppress you guys, let's get some more points on the board. Come here, boring ass. Or I'm the boring ass because I'm using a Kenzo weapon. Ah, damn it. Okay, you're playing the end zap. Well, I don't know. That's a pretty monochromatic weapon aside from the red trigger. You're a pretty boring ass yourself. <laughs> I am always getting shot on the way in. Good example of how vulnerable the set is due to no splat bomb. I want to go an unexpected way. I want to go around the sides and just be weird. I thought that was a sniper on the other team over there because that jellyfish was the right color. And I thought his arm was the sniping laser. Pressured that away. Got you. Getting that. Move this way. That's done. Heavy Splatling is still up. I was waiting to see if they would die while my back was turned. Okay. Gotcha. I was waiting for that. Taking the lead, what I like to see. I don't know if you like to see that, but I certainly do. Oh, their ink armor is poorly timed. Uh, I'm all for doing risky business. Let's go. Turn around flip. Uh. Oh, we got a guy here who's just sharking so that we can super jump to him. That's clever. Doing it. Good. Stop the push before it started. That's the important part. The, oh, the heavy splatling got him. We're kind of pushed back now. I think I'm mainly just going to slay right now. We do have a one point lead. It's not much. It is really pretty easy to score that many points on this, on this map. So you do got to still be careful. I think mainly just sneaking around, slaying, that's gonna be how I'm best used. It's over there. We already lost the Rainmaker. Ah! Got a little greedy. Rainmaker is ripe for the taking, and they got pretty good map control. Oh, yeah. I see some points in their future, as much as I don't like to admit that. There's. Oh, no. Okay. Made that throw the way I wanted, but it didn't quite hit them. Tagged right now, which sucks. Okay. Ready! No kill there. Uh 
no, 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 oh, no, I had the thought, I didn't mean to, I didn't know that I clicked the stick, I was just running around waving the capsule above my head, being like, die, 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 ah, I've never done that before, I didn't realize I clicked the stick, no, that's entirely on me, I had that shot lined up, if I just didn't have my special act, then we would have gotten it, oh my god, Uh, why are we camping in our base? We don't have the lead, guys. Oh, no, uh, my object damage ain't great, so let's just go around and just snuff out the problem. Hop, hop. No one sees me getting freaky. Good. That's what I want to do. I see you. Nope. Ah, uh, nope. I didn't even realize we were near the end of the time limit. I was just so salty from making that mistake. 62 to 69. Okay, any team that scores exactly 69 points deserves to win, let's be honest. The, the right outcome happened in this game, and not just because of my mistake. <laughs> I was like, why isn't it shooting? Why isn't it shooting? And then I looked above my head and... Uh... One win, one loss. Could have been worse. I feel like we always end on the same view, so let's check out this cool poster of some hair. That's all for now. Next time on Splatoon 2, we are taking a look at the longest range weapon of them all. It's less exciting than it sounds, I promise. See you guys then.